All right, everybody, this is the last unit, unit seven, for our test on Wednesday. Uh, hopefully, you've already been reviewing a little bit and have been waiting for me to post this. Uh, but if you have, here it is. So here we go. So we have 19th century perspectives and political developments, and those water drops on the screen there are uh, part of the design. So don't worry about your computer. Without further ado. There. Uh, our context for this uh, content unit. And so we kind of talked about these last times, right? Or by the time we get into the late 1800s, which is largely what we're talking about here, um, into the very early parts of the 1900s, Europe is the world power as far as continents go, right? And specifically Western Europe. So England, France, uh, now soon to be Germany, um, those kinds of countries, right? Those are the ones that kind of dictate the events of the world at this point for the most part. And again, you are looking at that through the Industrial Revolution. That is why of all the peoples and the countries and societies and cultures in the world, it's Western Europeans in the 1800s that are going to dominate, uh, for the most part, the world's affairs. Um, we're also in this new age of nationalism and this new age of revolution. We talked briefly about the revolutions of 1848 last video and those largely failed revolutions, but it's again the kind of cracks in the armor here of that traditional early 1800s European conservative, conservatism, right? Met or Metternich's conservatism, trying to maintain monarchy or the status quo for as long as possible in any country in Europe, not just France or anywhere in particular. All right, so nationalism is 7.2, and this is a big one, right? And this is the realization and the kind of self-identity of I belong to a country um, of people like me who speak like I do and who largely have the same values that I do. Um, and so this is this, you know, long-term reaction largely out of the French Revolution and Napoleon, where these countries or these peoples, I should say, start having this identity of I belong to something bigger than myself, right? If I'm Italian... I want to be part of a greater Italy. If I'm German, I want to be part of a greater Germany. I don't want to be subdivided into these 20, 30, 40 different little states. If I'm in Central Europe, um, I want to be part of something bigger. I'm tired of being always subjected to the wishes and the whims of larger, more powerful countries, right? If I'm the Italians, I'm tired of being told what to do by the Austrians, right? I want an Italian king. I want an Italian republic. I want an Italian government uh, at the end of the day, okay? So, Eventually, you get into unification, right? And with Italy, you have uh, the unification led by Piedmont Sardinia. And in Germany, you have the unification led by Prussia, right? And then 1861, Italy becomes a state. 1871, Germany becomes a state. Um, and this is a new, more modern, ver modern interpretation, something we're familiar with, of, you know, nationhood and being part of a country and everything else. Uh, one of the side effects of the rise of nationalism, and there are a lot of them, but one of them is going to be the rise of anti-Semitism uh, in Europe, right? Anti-Semitism being prejudice against Jewish people or the Jewish faith. And so in the, during the Enlightenment, there is the is kind of more lax or relaxed feeling or interpretation of, of Jewish people, right? That they, throughout the Middle Ages, are uh, persecuted. Not that it becomes this utopia or anything during the Enlightenment, but, you know, if you are pushing religious uh, toleration and things like that, then naturally uh, Judaism would become more and more tolerated. With anti-Semitism, you get the rise of, you know, in a, in a way that kind of populist uh, politics, right? Blaming uh, a group or an entity for a lot of society's problems or ills, right? So if we're in this height of nationalism where you're wanting people to feel, say, German or French or whatever it is, a good um, scapegoat would to be blame Jewish people right? Because you can say they don't belong in our country because they are not French or Italian or Russian or whatever, right? They are Jewish. And looking at that as a separate entity, almost like a, you know, it's a separate race. It's not a religious choice necessarily. If you're an anti-Semite, it is this feeling that you are Jewish and that's part of your blood, right? And so we had, we looked at some quotes way back when, back in February of um, these German politicians or maybe Prussian politicians who were saying, you know, a Jewish person cannot be German because they are a Jew first. And so if you look, start to look at any group of people, and this example is Jewish people, 
not as they have picked this religion and then they can forego this religion or adopt it or whatever, like you can any other religion. And you look at them like a race of people. And then suddenly that, that amount of prejudice can certainly, certainly increase. Um, looking at how some of these individuals we have down here, Napoleon III, uh, Camillo di Cavour of Italy and Otto von Bismarck of Prussia, later Germany, right? They use that kind of patriotism, that nationalism to achieve the goal they want. So if you're Cavour, right, um, you link up with the French there for a little bit to help you out uh, when they're still Piedmont, Sardinia, and then you raise that patriotism, that nationalism by making all the people of the Italian peninsula feel like maybe we'll be better off if we're all in this together and not be subdivided into smaller countries like Italy has been uh, really since the fall of the Roman Empire. Same thing with Bismarck, right? He has those handfuls of, um, and we'll get into this next unit, or next content piece, but he has those handful of wars, right? The Danish war, the Austro-Prussian war, the Franco-Prussian war, and largely they're about um, stimulating patriotism or in this case, nationalism, right? Because that's gonna unify a country. When we're looking at Austria, it does become Austria-Hungary, right? They grant uh, rights and laws to the uh, largest minority group, the Hungarians or the Magars. Um, but still, you know, we still have a very multi-ethnic Austria-Hungary there's more than just Germans and Hungarians. Um, but just, I know I've said this before, and I said it tons of time in class, nationalism destroys multi-ethnic countries, right? Nothing's going to destroy a multi-ethnic empire like Austria, Hungary, or the Ottomans more than these regional ethnicities demanding uh, independence or sovereignty or whatever it is. National unifications and diplomatic tensions. Um, the Crimean War will be that kind of telltale war for both the Ottomans and, and Russia as showing that they have fallen behind industrial, uh, industrialization with Western Europe, right? And so as far as the Ottomans are concerned, Russia has their own issues with this, but as far as the Ottomans are concerned, they still hold a pretty big chunk of Europe in the Balkans, and now it becomes very obvious, uh, almost inevitable, that the Ottomans will fall apart. And then the question that leads into World War I um, is who controls that area, right? That power vacuum that follows. If the Ottomans have held that for 200, 300, 400 years and they're gone, what follows that, right? Does another major country come in and absorb that? Do smaller countries form and absorb that power? Who's going to take that over? Um, so not too long after that, right, those kind of previews to, the, uh, to World War I, the Balkan Wars, that is a, you know, example of power vacuums, right? The Ottomans leave and then these other countries, these other groups are fighting amongst themselves to uh, achieve that land or to gain that land. So we just talked about this, right? But Cavour boosts the Piedmont Sardinian economy to make them a viable ally to France. Um, they fight with France for a while, France bails out. They don't win necessarily, but it does inspire those other Northern Italian states to join Piedmont Sardinia with the idea of kind of strength in numbers. And then Giuseppe Garibaldi, right? The Italian adventurer who moves to South America to Uruguay and then comes back and marches north of the peninsula with a bunch of adventurers and volunteers, and kind of, again, this romantic idea of being Italian, um, conquers southern Italy. And then Garibaldi and King Victor Emmanuel, they meet uh, near Rome, and he hands off the country to him, right? And now Italy has been unified under a monarchy. And so that is an example that we'll preview here in a second of real politic uh, from Garibaldi's point of view, because he wants a republic but he sacrifices that because he would rather have a unified Italy under any type of government than a continued to be fragmented government um, or fragmented Italy under his wish of government, right? He would rather have a unified monarchical Italy than a Republic of Southern Italy of Naples or something, right? So he is foregoing his personal desires for the greater good or for uh, Italian nationalism. And then with Bismarck, we just talked about this, right? Um, starts that Danish war, wins very easily. Then he fights the Austrians and kind of paints them as the, you know, multi-ethnic monster and not a state for the Germans. And then he, after he defeats Austria, he kind of goads France into declaring war on Prussia. That way he can unite all the Germans behind this common cause. And before you know it, Prussia is now Germany. Uh, and then think of all the fallout that happens after that. Bismarck eventually gets dismissed or fired. Um, after the king, uh, the first king of Germany dies, and when he is fired, Germany becomes closely tied to Austria-Hungary, kind of ignoring Russia, leaving them in the dust, and that forms this natural alliance between France and Russia, 
And now Germany is stuck between these two allies, right? The French and the Germans hate one another, um, or the Prussians and the French hate one another. And so Bismarck's goal for a long time is to simply kind of be allies with everybody else in Europe but France. The goal, and maybe even to ruin those relationships of other countries with France, to completely make France uh, isolated and by themselves. And that would make them, of course, easier to defeat in a war if it came to that. So when Bismarck is fired, that alliance with Russia is again left behind. Russia and France become allies. Um, before too long with imperialism, Britain will become allies with France after centuries of uh, dislike. And now Germany is in kind of this, uh, you know, no man's land, pardon the phrase there with World War I on the horizon. But, you know, Germany is kind of isolated besides Austria-Hungary. Okay, so this one will be quick, Darwinism and then social Darwinism, mainly the second part. So, you know, Darwinism is that social theory, or excuse me, biological theory of the strong survive, right? The strongest species will continue to uh, survive and the, the weaker ones will die off and that's what causes extinctions, right? That the strong survive and the weak die off. Um, and so if you apply those same kind of theories to society, that is going to be a major justification with conquering places and justification with um, promoting that certain races are superior to others. And I use that lion and gazelle example over and over and over, right? The lion is going to eat the gazelle in nature every single time. Um, and that's just the way nature works, right? And there's not a... Uh, you know, save the gazelle fund, and there's not a, you know, society that's based on limiting the natural instincts of the lion, that just happens. And so again, you apply these things to society and say Europe, a European country conquers Africa or part of Asia or whatever it is, you apply those same things. In this case, the lion is going to eat the gazelle. And if the gazelle doesn't like that, it needs to do something about it, right? It needs to figure out how to run faster, fight back or something but it is not the lion's job, in this case, Europe, it is not the lion's job to limit its superiority just because it has to, needs to feel sorry for the other groups, right? And so if you are somebody who is actively conquering another culture and causing death and despair and whatever, you know, you've got to justify it somehow. And maybe the simplest justification is, uh, this is my right to do this because I'm superior to you. 7.5, the age of progress and modern, uh, modernity. So we didn't really get into any philosophy stuff yet. I was kind of waiting until after World War I to talk about this. Um, but a couple of quick points. Positivism, or the belief that science is the only truth, is kind of, you know, branch off of skepticism, of rejecting that traditional authority, because, you know, just because something's been around for a thousand years doesn't necessarily make it right. Um, the second one kind of goes in with social Darwinism that the belief that society is propelled by conflict and struggle, that peace is a bad thing because peace can make us uh, complacent and not develop as a society, right? Make us soft. And so you think about something like war and if two countries or two factions are at war with one another for say 10 years, think about how much that military technology from year one to year 10 must have uh, progressed. Because if you are in direct competition with somebody, you're forced to constantly improve or you will be defeated. It's the same thing with uh, like economic capitalism, right? If there was only one company in America or the world that produced cell phones, um, there is no incentive for them to get better because they have no competition. But if there's at least one other group that's uh, competing with them in that market, then they have to improve their product, right? Because they have to improve their product or they're going to be defeated by their competitor. And if there was only one cell phone company uh, or one cell phone manufacturer, to stick with this example, you know, the types of cell phones we'd have would be limited, right? Maybe the numbers would be limited because if I own the only cell phone company in the world um, and I'm a million cell phones short for everyone to have one, I'm not worried that someone's going to go buy my competitor's cell phone. They just have to wait for me. And if they do have to wait for me, then I'm probably not pr uh, progressing as far as my technology or my business practices go or anything, right? And so you'll see a lot of rhetoric around this time, you know, when people talk about world peace, some people say, you know, that's a bad thing. We've made it to the point we've made it to in the world after centuries and centuries of almost nonstop wars and struggles and revolutions. Um, 
maybe we should, you know, take a hint from that. Uh, I'd read a little bit about kind of these early 1900s, early 20th centuries, uh, psychologist or psychotherapist like Sigmund Freud, you know, the conscious versus the subconscious or the ego, the id and the super id or super, me, super ego. Um, but again, that kind of understanding that we have our conscious thoughts and our conscious actions, but there's a part of us uh, that we have no control over that dictates our, you know, kind of our sudden movements, our sudden actions, our almost kind of quote unquote lizard brain, right? I would read a little bit about those guys. Okay, uh, imperialism, motivations and methods. So there are, and I have them listed here, and we'll go through them one by one, economic, political, and cultural motivations to the new imperialism. So new imperialism is that 1800s Africa and Asia stuff, while the old imperialism is largely North and South America or the quote unquote new world. So the economic motivations. Um, the biggest one, or the, I guess these are about tied, I suppose, the need for raw materials, all these untapped resources in Africa and Asia that the natives of those places didn't really uh, prioritize. Those things can be harvested, sent back to Europe, sent to all the factories of Europe, and now they can be uh, turned into or converted to manufactured goods. Uh, but then the new markets as well, right? At some point in Europe, markets get saturated where only so many people want something or can afford it. And once they have purchased those things, then that market kind of shrivels up, right? And so when we say saturated, it's like a sponge. Take a sponge, you dunk it in the water. At some point, that sponge can only take so much water before that's no longer absorbing. And so if there are millions and millions of millions of people in Africa or Asia, or wherever it is, that don't have these goods, if I'm a European business person or I control certain industries, I want my country to take over these places because now I have that many more people I can sell my stuff to, right? Um, and then kind of leading in to the next one, political motivations. You know, if you're, say, France or whatever, the last thing you want is uh, England or at this point, the United Kingdom to get every single uh, colony that's out there, right? You don't want them to have a monopoly on all the colonies and places in Africa and Asia, because then they're going to benefit and defeat you um, because they have more money than you and all the things that money can purchase you, purchase for you. So when we talked about Germany and Bismarck, right? Germany is a great example of grabbing colonies in Africa. And even if they're somewhat useless, quote unquote, useless colonies, um, they do it because politically it looks good. And if I'm the average German citizen reading the newspaper each day, and I see Britain and France and, and whatever as gaining colonies and conquering people and blah, 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 you know, I start to look at my country and say, why aren't we doing those things, right? I thought I was supposed to be, uh, you know, I thought Germans were the smartest, toughest, whatever, but then the British and the French are beating us to the punch with getting colonies. So there becomes, again, this not only political as far as getting people's votes and getting their energy behind you, but also political in that you don't want Britain to throw off the balance of power by completely conquering the entire continent of Africa. And then the cultural motivations, right? Kind of leading to that social Darwinism, that belief that, you know, European races and culture and religions are superior to the other ones of the world. And that white man's burden idea of it is Europeans duty to lift up those uh, societies, right? To lift them out of the darkness, so to speak, okay? And again, we talk about you need, you need justification to do certain things, right? If you're going to enslave somebody, you're going to conquer somebody, you're going to start a war, you need some sort of mental justification or otherwise, you know, you just seem kind of like a sociopath. Um, from my understanding, what I've read, right, is that about 1880, the gap between European technology and the technology of the natives of Africa um, are, as, is a wider gap than any point in history right? Even if you go back to the 1500s with the Spanish conquering South America, I mean, they had muskets and everything and steel, but uh, the gap wasn't that wide yet. I mean, it's still wide, don't get me wrong, but it's not anything like in the late 1800s when there's machine guns and, you know, we're getting close to planes and mortars and everything else. Uh, and they're going against these warriors of Africa who are fighting with almost Stone Age weapons, right? And so when you think about how can a tiny continent like Europe conquer a giant continent like Africa, well, a major uh, technological advantage in military technology is certainly a reason for that. Um, another big reason is better medicines and anti-malarial uh, treatments and everything. So quinine is a big one where for basically as long as Europe has known about Africa, which has been since you know the days of the Greeks, um, 
a lot of Europeans don't go very far into Africa because of how sick they get, right? They're not used to the tropical environments and they get malaria because they get eaten alive by mosquitoes and everything else. Um, once they have those anti-malarial treatments, now Europeans can go into Africa. You know, one of those kind of weird facts of history to me is that Europeans did not discover the source of the Nile River, Lake Victoria, uh, until the 1800s, right? They, but they knew of the Nile River since like 2000 BC. And so of course, Africans knew where the source of the Nile River was, but to give you an idea of just how impenetrable Africa was to most Europeans, now that's a great, to me, a great example that Europeans didn't know where the source of the Nile River was until, again, the 19th century. So global effects, and this kind of leads into World War I down the line, right? European alliances are stressed as countries argue about colonies. Um, and a great example is Britain and Germany becoming enemies due to the argument over African colonies. And then later in World War I, of course, Britain and Germany will fight on opposing sides. Um, thinking about how nationalism is not just a European thing. Any group of people from any continent can be nationalists. And so any of the places conquered by the Ottomans from the 1500s to the 1800s, you know, they're gonna have this feeling of nationalism too. It's not like the Greeks are the only group that can feel nationalism. Uh, you know, if you're the Egyptians and you've been conquered by the Ottomans, you can be an Egyptian nationalist. If you're the Vietnamese and you've been conquered by the French in the 1800s, you can become a Vietnamese nationalist, right? Um, so just understanding these nationalist movements just kind of take over the world. And you think about countries today, you know, there's, I mean, America is certainly unique um, in our melting pot kind of society, but a lot of countries, you know, you go to France, most people are French. You go to Germany, most people are German. Of course, there's migration and everything else, but that's the way kind of modern country borders have been shaped based on ethnicity. All right, so 7.8, I have a YouTube video here and I'll post it uh, in the description on this video, but uh, this is a lot about art and I'm not very well versed in art, right? So I found this video of a guy talking about art, talking about this concept, um, and I would check it out, right? Um, Normally in, in class, I do a art crash course kind of thing where I kind of clumsily go through my understanding of art in about 30, 40 minutes. Um, but I think I would check this out, right? If you're trying to fill all your gaps or cover all your bases, I would take 30 minutes, 40 minutes in the next day or two, because we only have that many days left, uh, to check out this video. Okay, so that's it for unit seven. Um, I'll obviously gonna post this this morning on Monday. And if you got any questions, Please let me know. Thank you, guys.